All right, it's uh, really cool to have you here. Um, this interactive music symposium, it's the very first time we're doing that. So it's something, an idea we had about, I don't know, five, six months ago, um, saying, well, maybe we need to do something focused on music solely. Um, and we had as a as the main audience in mind, uh, we were saying, well, maybe we should invite composers from the linear world that are interested uh, in knowing more about how is it going when you're doing music in an interactive context, be it for game or for a simulation or for location-based entertainment, rides, attraction parks, that sort of things. Uh, it, like They're all converging toward interactivity now and gets the player to interact with the ride and, and things like that. So, um, and the way you think about, like your strategies to write the music is uh, a bit different uh, when you're faced with interactivity, when you're faced with timing that you are not in control of, contrarily to scoring for a film where you know exactly what's happening at every single frame. <laughs> in a video game, it's quite different. So, um, so that's why we reach out to, um, well, people we knew were in the linear, uh, world and obviously I was looking at uh, people who registered here. We've got people from games as well. So who, who's working in video game company at the moment? So uh, ah, a fair bunch of you. Who's like linear music only? Mostly. Okay, we still have a few. All right. So uh, <laughs> that's fine. Any programmer in here? All right, a couple in the back. Programmers always in the back. Half programmer, more in the front. All right. <laughs> So, uh, any game designers or artists? Uh, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, anyone I forget? Sound designers? Yeah, obviously. That's a good one. Um, all right. So, we have a, a day, a uh, full day, actually. And um, so, I'm going to start. So, we say crash course. The, the main idea was to, again, this audience, people that never done game before, just to give you like a 45 minutes about like what it is to uh, score for uh, an interactive context. And then uh, we're going to have other people. Actually, I, I have the uh, our menu of the day. So, this morning, so the first hour, that's going to be me uh, talking about interactive music in general. And then, uh, just after, we're going to have Kieran Walsh that's going to talk about different uh, experiences he's been working on. So, Kieran is really doing a lot of stuff in VR, in uh, location-based entertainment, in games. He's both programmer and sound designers and composer and everything. Um, and then, we're going to have uh, lunch. So, um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, that's for the, the first section. By the way, something you need to know, uh, apparently, the doors are closed because it's a public space and so on. If you need to go out the room, there's a green button on the right side of the door. Just press on it, and then you can go out. So don't panic in front of the door. There's a button for you <laughs> to go out. Uh, and then somebody will open the door so that you can get back in the room if you need to. So that's going to be uh, our morning. We have a lunch. And again, the, the old idea here is it's a social event. It's a place to exchange ideas and meet new persons. And it's a community-driven thing. So we're there to talk. Um, you can ask questions. Like It's, it's open, right? It's open-ended. And then this afternoon, we're going to start with a panel. Uh, moderated by John Broomhall. So I'm guessing that many of you know John already. Uh, is John in the room? No? Oh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, you're totally in the dark. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I met John the first time, I think it was, I don't know, eight, nine years ago at Develop, and he was hosting the audio track there. And I was struck by how good he was as an ambassador for that Develop thing. And, and just introducing people and so on. So to me, it was kind of a, uh, a no-brainer to, uh, to speak with John and say, hey, do you want to be part of this event? Um, and then he regrouped a fantastic panel uh, with Alistair Lindsay, with James Hannigan and Alan Wilson. So I'm pretty sure, John, that you're going to introduce them or they're going to introduce themselves a bit more. I think you're nodding yes, so uh, good for that. And then followed by Olivier de Rivière, that is, I like to describe Olivier as a wise master Jedi, level 10. Uh, <laughs> he's really pushing the envelope on it and on all aspects. And not only in the interactive music section of wise, really 
across the thing. So, uh, so that's certainly uh, a, a good talk uh, in front of us. And then we're going to finish the day with another panel moderated by John, uh, this time uh, talking more about business. And this is something that, like, if you go on the internet and if you look in YouTube and videos and blog articles, there's not a lot of people talking about contracts, how they work, how much they pay, what to think about when you're negotiating a contract for an interactive media. Like for film, it's kind of, we know like the, the, the premises of that, there's a long history behind that, but for games and interactive media, not so much. So, um, so again, John Regroup, um, these four gentlemen here that are really knowledgeable about uh, signing contracts, rights, and all that. So again, Alistair is going to be there, Richard Jock, Tom Weller, and Daryl Alexander. And then beer and food and all that. So uh, gathering. So if you stay till the end, uh <laughs> that's what we have. All right. Are we ready to start the day? All right. So what is it when you do a game, for example? Um, Contrarily to a film where everything is static, everything is linear, and it's mainly like your stereo or your 5-1 stamp that you're delivering to the mixer and everything is set in time, when you do a game or whatever other interactive uh, content, it's running in real time. So it's actually a big software. A video game is just a glorified software with gorgeous pictures and fantastic sounds playing along, but it's a software. So as a software, you need a tool to run that software, and that's called the game engine. And the game engine is comprised of many subcomponents dealing with rendering of the picture, with physics, with AI, dealing with talking to the hardware itself, to the, the, the memory, to the CPU, streaming resources of the disk, and so on. And of course, part of that is the sound engine. And that's what we do. That's what WISE is doing. So yeah, so WISE is running alongside uh, the rest of the game systems. And that's why it's called middleware. It stands between like the content of the game and the actual console, the platform running that, or your phone, and so on. So for us, the name of the game is to make sure that we run on all the platforms available out there, that we run on all the commercial game engine, alongside tons of proprietary game engines from various companies, and having third-party plugins as well that can connect to, uh, to WISE. So, so just before looking into um, how things are made in WISE, and here, again, I'm taking like 35 minutes to, to show that, so, and we have a full certification for it, so I'm just glancing over stuff. But I just wanted to make sure that people that never worked in game has some sort of understanding how your creative content and how you try to be creative is always counterbalanced by hardware limitation and software limitations and boundaries and constraints there. So it's a balancing act between what's available and how clever you are to go around those limits and still do something artistically valid in there. And for that, let's just look at the first three generations of, um, of console. So back in 72, that's where it all started, um, the Magnavox Odyssey, they had a Pong game without audio. And curiously, it's been a commercial flop. And the same year, Atari came out with Pong, but this time around with audio, Bang! Huge success. I don't know for you, but I think audio has something to do with it. And, but the thing is, there were no sound card, audio chip, anything audio. And it's literally, the story is, the day before going to uh, manufacturing the console in mass, that the electrical engineer um, working there said, OK, we need audio. How do I do that? And he looked at the sync generator. So you know, the sync generator is the thing that is basically spitting out your pictures, like 30 frames or 25 frames per second. And that's the sync generator for picture. He said, so this is, there's a clock in there. So maybe I can tap in that clock and extract some audio out of that. And that's what he did. And we ended up with this. <laughs>
Isn't it great? Have you played the real thing? What? Yeah, some of you are nodding. Like two, three years ago, I have a friend that had the thing <laughs> connected to his TV with the old analogic thing and UHV and all that thing. We spent the entire evening doing that. <laughs> it was great. And I won. We we've done a championship, and I ended up <laughs> winning that. <laughs> all right, so that's the first generation. And then the second generation, there's a bunch of uh, different manufacturers starting doing things. And when we look at the Intellivision, Intellivision console, um, it has three channels. Isn't it great? Like, instead of just having one sound at a time, you have up to three. And, but they were sharing the same ADSR. So if you wanted some release, your three voices had the same release, the same shape for that. But you could control the noise generator per voice and have different volume for noise per voice. So that's really great. So what do you do when you have three voices and you want to make music, sound effects, and ambience maybe, like everything, and you have three channels? So composers back then were using a technique called voice stealing. So basically, they had music running, and as soon as a sound effect was triggered, let's say you're shooting something or you destroy something, uh, that sound was taking over one of the music voice playing, and as soon as that sound effect was over, the music resumed on that, that track of the music was resuming, and so on. And it sounded like this. So here's a collection of a few famous um, games back then. Tell me if you recognize some of the soundtracks. Isn't it great? <laughs> and then, when we look at the third generation, I think most of us have played games on the NES before, so that was really luxury. Like, you, we had five channels, so that was great. Um, and so, but the memory was super small. Like, it was like on the cartridge, you had a few Ks in there for the entire game. So maybe one K for sound, and that was a big budget back then. So uh, what do you do in terms of composing music that will be reused throughout 15 hours of gameplay, for example? So composers were trying to be as clever as they could. So they, they would write a certain piece of music and then do permutation of it or mirroring the music or then pitching them, modulating, doing parallel melodies. like. Anything, like you just reuse the same sequence and do some maths on it so that you reuse the same memory and you're just changing the content by doing some whatever maths in there. And just for the sound of it, I found on the internet a fantastic video describing the, fi the five channels, how they were used. Um, and uh, I'll put the reference in that in the, in the video. It's really a great video. So I invite you to read at the bottom of the screen. It goes relatively fast, but it explains everything um, that you could do with those five channels.
<laughs> so I, I'm a strong believer that creativity comes from limitation, or when you have a lot of limitation, like there's no other choice, you need to be creative and so on. So those consoles back then were just forcing us doing that. So of course, nowadays, um, we have way more uh, memory available, way more DSP available, streaming, we can use PCM files like crazy, and so on, but we're still stuck with limitations because guess what? <laughs> Game designers are just adding more and more content and there's more and more things to put sounds on, um, like hundreds of characters on screen and dynamic uh, lighting, dynamic uh, time of day rolling by that require you to change the content of the ambience, the music, and so on. So we're just faced with the same problem at a larger scale. And we're still always lacking resources and uh, in the end, it's the, it's the name of the game. And as soon as like, the hardware goes up, well, we reuse the old hardware and we put that in whatever things. So 10 years ago, it was in two phones. Now our phones are super powerful. And soon enough, it's going to be in teddy bear, right? We're going to have the same chips and we're going to do video games for teddy bears. And that's, we're going to be stuck with the same limitations. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> it's just a matter of time before we get there. Um, OK, so let's look at WISE from a high-level perspective. But just before that, let's look at what is interactive music from a high-level perspective? Really, if you're looking at that from above, it's really not that much. It's really easy. There's two main components, actually, to it. So first of all, there's the actual content you're doing. And for example, you're going to write content that is matching uh, the game mechanics. So for example, if I have a game where I can be in stealth mode, so that's my game state A, and transitioning to fight, and that's how the gameplay is, is made. You hide in the dark, and eventually you had to fight some guards. So that's the game mechanics, and you go back and forth from those game states. And for certain games with, with more narrative content, you might, that game mechanics might be interrupted by story events. So you meet the princess for the first time, and guess what? She's kidnapped just before your eyes. And, <laughs> and then you have a whole story starting. So those uh, cinematic moments are going to interrupt the game mechanics. So that's content you're writing to fit to pieces of gameplay or story. So that's one thing. And then it's all a matter of saying, how will we manage the transitions between those music pieces so that it flows smoothly, like a movie, like a song, like it flows naturally from one place to another while you're not in control of the actual pace of things. So the same game played by someone that is going frantically over the level versus the other person that really takes the time to hide in the dark and take his time to explore everything, the soundtrack sounds way different. And it's still the same content produced by the same composer and the same sound designers there. It's just put in place in a different pace, in a different manner. So how do you account for that? And so that's for that. And when we look at the transition rules themselves, again, it's really simple. You are playing some music. You're already in some states, so that's your source music. And you have to jump into a destination music, a different state or a certain story event that is happening. So you're going to ask questions like, when should I leave the source music to jump somewhere else? Is it immediately, next bar, next beat, next cue? So maybe you inserted certain cues in, in your music segments that are good moments to leave the music. And then, where do you jump to in your destination? A lot of time it makes sense to jump at the beginning of, of it, but sometimes it could be a queue in the middle as well because it matches where you left. And sometimes it could be same time as where you were playing in the source. So you were seven bar, two beat in your source music and you want to jump seven bar, two beats in your destination. And you know it's going to work because you're using the same tempo and the same chord progression, for example. So you just need some crossfade by doing that and you have something flowing um, in a logical manner for that. And sometimes, if you go from C major to uh, F sharp, diminish something weird, then you might need the help from a transition segment. So the composer has the ability to write a specific piece of music that is bridging the gap between the source to the destination over there. 
So that's roughly interactive music, right? Different content and how to transition there. So let's look at another angle, music variability. So a film, 90 minutes, 120 minutes, maybe 140 minutes of content, and you're done, right? So the composer can write everything on screen and it's fine, but uh, for games, you're not in control of time, and you don't want anyone to go crazy like that <laughs> if he's playing the game for hundreds of hours. So how do you make sure that your music is going to have enough variation and brief enough so that it keeps being interesting for the players? While the premises is, for example, for a game that has a story mode, uh, you're going to have between 6 to maybe 15 hours of gameplay, in average, for AAA games with a huge story and all that. That's, that's about the average, and I'm excluding the crazy stuff from Rockstar games, for example. But in general, that's kind of the average we have. And if that game has a multiplayer mode, or it's a game that is only multiplayer, then it's just infinite. Right? I've got friends playing Call of Duty two or three hours every night for the last year. So that's a thousand hours <laughs> at, at the end of the year. And your composer had a contract to write one, maybe two hours of content. So how do you get that two hours of content and stretch it over an infinite amount of, of time? So that's an interesting challenge. And that's with this thing in mind that we developed the interactive music system. We provide ways to play the content in different matters, different manners to be able to stretch that content over time. So let's look at it. So there are three uh, different angles to look at music variability. And the first one, you're responsible for it as a composer. If you write, uh, okay, we'll get to there. The second one is at the sound engine level, what are the features available? And finally, the game mechanics will make your game highly repetitive or not by the sheer gameplay, like how the gameplay is structured. It can be very repetitive or not, depending on how it is. So at the composition level, that's the part where you're in control. And it's just a single slide because you know what you're doing, you're composers already, but just make sure that if you score your game, like try to change tempo <laughs> from one place to another. Try not to write in 4-4, just so it's a bit less, like it's a bit different, right? There's something with timing and so on. So just try 5-4 and 7-8 and what's not, just something, it, it helps just reducing this repetition. And avoid any patterns. Don't put drum loops in your music, please. Because your two-bar drum loops, you're going to hear it over and over. And one music of that two-bar repeated, it's not 60 seconds of music. It's four seconds of music repeating with some stuff on top of it. But try to go away from patterns as much as possible. That will help. OK, so now let's look at the sound engine level. And in this case, in Wise. Um, there are plenty of stuff you can do with that, and people will talk about it during the day as well. So, of course, you can like transpose your content, you can apply uh, volume changes, DSP, or randomize sequence, switch, that sort of things. But it all starts with one thing, the ability to have uh, music segments that can loop gracefully. And that will help us to transition after that. So, first of all, if we look at this is an eight bar music going on, and it needs to loop. But guess what? The music naturally, uh, at the end of it, usually you have a, a tail there, right? There's maybe a cymbal crash going on, reverb, and whatever uh, release from the instruments that are there. But you need to loop from that part to the beginning of it. So, what were we doing prior to Wise and prior to other tools like that? We had to, the composer had to chop that part in the end and move it at the beginning and mix it with the beginning of the song. So that each time it loops, you have that cymbal crash and the reverb release and everything printed in the file. So it sounds seamlessly, right? It loops seamlessly. The only 
limitation or annoying thing is the very first time you play that, you start with a crash <laughs> with its reverb. So that's uh, less interesting. So it, to help that, what we've done is we allow people to import music and to set where is the entry queue and the exit queue in the file so that we can play a pickup and we can play a release of it. And looping is actually not looping. It's actually playing the same file over the one that is finishing there and we're starting a new file. So during that period of time, we're actually playing two files there. But uh, that allows to have your pre-entry and your reverb mixed gracefully with it. And we do the same thing. So that's kind of OK for looping, but it's really, really a time saver and a lifesaver for many when you're doing branching. So if you go from segment A to segment B, now I have two completely different music going on, and I can still have my release that is just ending gracefully, and I have my pickup for the next music. And same thing for a different segment like that. And that's why it's really easy to write music in WISE and transition from a place to another uh, in many circumstances because of those pre-entry and post-exit portion um, that you can set in your music. And right now I'm showing just stereo files, but you can apply that on a multi-track, right? A music segment in WISE is actually a multi-track object. It's like a, a mini session that you have there. So you can create as many tracks as you want in there, set your entry queue, your exit queue, and you're good to go from to go from one multi-track segment to another multi-track segment if you want to. So I know there's a lot of smart people here already thinking, yeah, but streaming a stereo file versus streaming five stereo files, isn't it, isn't it more expensive? Why should we stream five files instead of just one? So one good reason for it is because you can attach to each of these tracks, you can attach what we call real-time parameter control. So that's an information that's coming from the game. And I have an example here where we will attach the stealth factor of a game. So it's a stealth game. And the game, and so if you do a stealth game and your character can hide in the dark and be exposed to the light, and that will probably be handled by the AI system for the guards that are trying to spot you in the map. So the game is already calculating a stealth factor. The game is already trying to gauge how well exposed or hidden you are in the environment. They have that data. What you want as a composer or a sound designer is to get the game sending you that value and you're going to use that to modulate how the music feels so that you're also helping the game or the player tipping in, well, the music is changing and kind of tell you you're currently super exposed, watch out, versus no, you're well hidden. So for that, you will use real-time parameter control. And here's an example where on one track, on the x-axis, this is my stealth factor from 0 to 100%, and it's simply attached to the volume of this track. And with that, you can control um, how it sounds. So let me just go to single screen for one second and let's make the example here. So here I'm in WISE and I have attached on two of the tracks, I have attached an RTPC, a game parameter. So that's my stealth factor on the x-axis and it's driving the volume. So in real time, the game is actually just modulating this value as it does for the AI and it could sound like that. You're in the dark. You're exposed. Simple enough, isn't it? Like, there's nothing rocket science here. It's cheap, so no one can complain you're using more CPU or whatever. <laughs> you're just changing one volume, so that's really not the end of the world. But yes, it's worth having more than a stereo track if you want to do that. So you have some stems that will be attached to those uh, game parameters. So that's really one of the, the most basic examples uh, for, for that. So going back to 
So not only you can have multiple tracks in WISE, but you can also have multiple subtracks on a given track. And here in this example, I've simply separated the bass, the drum, the piano uh, in different ways. So for example, this is the bass track that you're seeing. So I just have four variations of that bass track. So each time that segment will start playing, WISE will pick one of the bass track randomly in there. So that just helped. We are talking about music variations, right? So it just helped getting the thing a bit different each time you play. And then looking at the brass section, um, it's set to sequence. So the first time this segment plays, it's going to pick the first brass uh, clip there, the second time, the second, third, and so on. And one that is really interesting is switch tracks. And with switch, again, it's the same idea of taking information from the game and using that information to change things. And here's a re like an example from Mario. So we all know that Mario can be small, tall, can throw fireballs, for example. So why not taking that information from the game and have a different piano track playing depending on which state Mario is at a given moment? And the thing is, what is, as a composer, what takes time is to come up with your musical theme, right? Is to come up with a song that sounds good and that's your, that works with the game. But then, creating four variations of the bass line, that's really easy, right? It's just variation on something that already works. So you can output tons of those with just maybe 10% more time working on that song, but 50, if not 100 more variations of that song. So that's one way of taking an hour of music and stretching it over the course of whatever duration your game is. Uh, and finally, at the segment, not only you can uh, use pre-rendered music, but you can also import MIDI clips into it and mix and match those together and build your virtual instrument and get uh, a mix of MIDI and pre-rendered music. And MIDI is cool because <laughs> it's really flexible and it costs nothing. The, real, the only challenge is to get uh, good virtual instruments that are sounding uh, good for the context of your, uh, of your music and the context of the game. All right, so that's, that's for the segment part of it. Now, everything in WISE is built as hierarchies. So the music segment has children, they are tracks. And, but a music segment can be integrated into a parent called the music playlist. And one playlist can contain as many segments as you want in there. And you can have those segments and subparts of segments playing in random or sequentially or a mix of both there so that with a few segments, again, each time you're playing the playlist, they're not played exactly in the same order, creates diversity. It helps it breathe a bit more. And those music playlists are attached or are included into another pattern that is the switch container. So the switch, the music switch container manage the transitions and your playlists are attached to the game states. You remember when we're talking about game mechanics and you're attaching music to that? It's it's the music playlist that you're attaching to your music state. And the music switch is, has all the, the transition rules and dictates how those transitions uh, should go. Actually, you are deciding how the transition should go and the switch <laughs> is just doing what you're asking him to do. At a glance, that's what WISE offers you. And we're going to see other people here talking about it, I'm guessing. I haven't seen that presentation. But. And in any case, do your 101 and do your 201, and, and the music is great in the 201, and it's really cool. Uh, this, this certification is really cool, and it's free, by the way. So everything we do is free, it, like using WISE itself, uh, the, the certification content, everything academic is free. We're a strong believers that knowledge should be free. So there's only, who said that? <laughs> yeah. So there's only the exam that you need to pay uh, to take the exam, and if you pass it, and that's 90%, so you better study your stuff. <laughs> and if you want to be recognized as a certified user, and that grants you access to our database, the creator's directory, so that 
people can query for people in your area that are certified users. So that grants you access to that. So yes, yeah, so, so that you can say, I am certified, and we know that you know your, your thing. Uh, that costs 200 bucks. $200. Not that expensive if you compare with other certification out there. Uh, our goal is that maybe in five or ten years we're going to recoup the investment <laughs> we've done with this two hundred dollars um, in there. But for but the, the knowledge itself, it's free. The content is there. So who pays for Wise? It's the game developers or the the simulation developer, or anyone. If they want to have Wise running in real time. In a, on a console or whatever, in a location somewhere, then they have to. They are paying for the a license to use Wise for a given title in a given context. But you, as content providers, you're not paying. That's it's free. So you just download it. Just go on their website and download the thing. All right. And final thing on music variability, and it's related with game mechanics. And to me, when I look at game mechanics, I instantly extract musical forms in it. So the same way that, like in, in classical music, for example, if you study in classical music, you certainly saw that a rondo is, goes like A, B, A, C, A, D, so you're always going back to your theme that is the A. Or if you do a sonata allegro, the allegro movement, it's separated in three sections, and inside the sections, you typically have that kind of structure in there. So that's the form for a sonata allegro. Or if you do a 12-bar blues, that's roughly what you're going to end up playing, right? Or a, a rock song or a pop song, that's the form of it. We know it's structured like that, and that's it. It's just how the music is structured. And if you do a pop song, it's probably that, but you just exclude the guitar solo from that place <laughs> and you have your pop song, right? So, um, so how about typical interactive music form? How do you decide if it's a 12-bar blues or a rock structure that you're going to do? So you're not deciding as a composer. The game is telling you which form you're going to need to adopt. And you do your music not for you because you're a composer and you're so good and so on. No, you're doing that your service at the service of the content. And the content is the game and the gameplay, of course, by extension. That's, that's the thing uh, in the end that you score to. So I'm going to show uh, three typical music structures that you will probably end up adopting to a certain extent if you start uh, doing games. Or if, and anyway, we've got many people from games there, so I'm pretty sure you're going to recognize some of those structures. So, sequencing. And the very first game I've done back in my days at Ubisoft in Montreal, um, it was an action-adventure game, and at the end of certain levels, there was a bus. So, what do you do when you meet a bus? You fight the bus. <laughs> That's the only way to get to the next portion of the game. And most buses had this sequential structure where you were starting with an introduction, so that was the bus telling you, I'm going to crush you, and <laughs> that's the exposition of it. And then you start fighting, and so you're in stage one up until either you die, which will get you to the defeat theme, uh, or up to when you find the pattern and you finally hit him at the right place at the right moment, that will go to the transition thing, say, oh, you hit me hard, but I've got friends, and he's throwing you more enemies as he's fighting you, that sort of thing. So you see that the kind of progression, and at any given moment, we could either transition to death or to the next transition moment up to the victory portion of it. So to have some reactiveness, we had 16 bar segments per stage, and they were split into one bar section and with the technology we had back then we were able to exit at the end of a of a piece of music <laughs> uh, to a different places and it was up to the composer to make sure that we could switch because there were no crossfades and fancy stuff like that it was like hard cut to <laughs> the other stuff so we had to test like bar one with victory bar one with transition bar two with transition bar two, blah, 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 like this so a lot of hard work uh, to get there. And an example from Guy Whitmore, uh, that's a game, a uh, really old game, um, called Russian Square, and he's using that sequencing technique for that, 
that's in the era of drum and bass, so uh, in terms of style. And here we go. Make sense? All right. Another technique, the layering. And this is almost as old as once we started using WAV file in video game. So the first three generation of consoles I was showing, it was literally like sound chips and the synthesizer you were addressing. But when once we started having audio files that could be streamed, we started using the layering technique. Mostly, uh, so how it works, it's, so in this example, you've got three tracks playing. And the first track, the exploration, is always playing. And again, so in this fictional game, the threat level uh, to the main character is driving uh, when the danger track, the second track, should start playing on top of exploration to add some tension, for example. And then when the game detects that you're higher 80% of threat level, then it's supposed that you're in combat mode, and then you have a third layer on top of the music playing there. So really not rocket science. And why people were using that? Because it was easy to output a six-channel file and just get the sound engine that they had to start with the first two channel and then change the volume of channel three and four and five and six. And Dynamically, you had interactive music uh, using this approach. So, and I even heard like some game, the music was streamed from the hard drive, and it was red book music. But they were so they were taking the stereo file, and they had a score that was two mono tracks basically. So there was exploration as a mono track, and another track for the the, the tension level, and that was the second track. And it was a full blown orchestra and mono. And it was sounding fantastic, like mono is good, mono is okay, right? <laughs> We're going crazy with the number of channels, but a, a good mono mix was okay, and it, all that they needed for that game, and it was just streaming off the CD. So <coughs> uh, recently, well, that has a few years already, but Alien Isolation just took this idea and pushed it to uh, six level. And how they, so basically over time, uh, there it was the tension was changing based on proximity or awareness, so how much the aliens are aware of your presence. So over time, your peaks could look like that. And by the way, so just level one is already super stressful music. <laughs> and then you add level two and level three, and level six is just unbearable. So you're there just for a few seconds, uh, hopefully. <laughs> um, so don't forget there's a green button if you want to go out at uh, the other door, just after this one. Or maybe there's two green buttons. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and just before the peaks, they were playing uh, stingers, just to add a little bit more stress to it. So uh, I've got a short video of it. It's about a minute. Um, yeah. If you so this is three years ago, maybe? Uh, approximately? <laughs>
collect my things and we can leave. Some people like it. <laughs> I never even tried playing those games. I, I know I won't be. I wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, <laughs> and another uh, mechanics is called branching, basically. So uh, instead of it looks like the sequencing, but instead of going in one specific direction, uh, usually you start somewhere in the middle of it, and you can branch to various game states um, from, so uh, this example was for a puzzle game, and depending how you were performing and what kind of jewels you're taking, you can go, you can go fall down up to defeat or rising up to victory. So uh, I'll skip the demo just because I'm a bit aware of time and we'll try to uh, uh, not uh, be too late in this. And, and by the way, so we have Olivier de Riviere this afternoon talking about stuff, but a few years back he worked on Remember Me, and I asked if Olivier could send me his wise session, which he did, and the structure of it. And that's what he sent me. Those were the game states uh, he had to go from and to at any given moment. And that's just for the, the combat music. So for the exploration, it was something else. And I was looking at this and the wise project, and I say, no, he's wrong. That's it's way more complicated than that. So I, <laughs> I started putting all the music uh, states that I found in the WISE project, put that there, and start looking at the transition rules and drawing lines between boxes from which source to which destination you could go. And by working on the explicit uh, transitions, so in WISE, an explicit transition is one that you, you created a new transition rule and you set your settings on how to transition when and how to jump where and so on. But because we're doing hierarchies in WISE, the child, like the children, under a specific transition inherit those rules. So I started writing all the implicit transitions. And that's where PowerPoint was not the best tool to... Uh <laughs> so there are more than that, but I stopped at that point. So yeah, it can, it can go to that level of complexity if the gameplay requires it. And their gameplay had so many combo mode and so many stages in which you could go and fight. And Olivier just embraced it because that's how he is as a composer. He's sitting with the, the game uh, designers and the game uh, cr creators and the artistic director and so on, really try to understand how the game behaves and then he score music according to that. He's really embracing the game system, and that's what he ended up with. And I'm pretty sure he's going to talk about this principle, at least, maybe not this game, but that's really ingrained on how we see uh, how music should be done for interactive media. All right, so as a wrap-up for the game mechanics portion of it for um, uh, ensuring some variation. So there's the sequencing approach, branching, layering, and... Uh, in terms of music variability, of course, it starts with what you're writing yourself, the music you're doing, and what the sound engine can offer as uh, opportunities to create more diversity. And interactive music is not difficult at all. It's just about writing the right music for the right portion of it and managing your transition correctly, and here you go. That's it. So uh, that was it for me. Yeah. <clears throat>